Well, thank you everyone for coming. Today I, we're going to be talking about finite state machines. So even before starting, I have two quick questions. If you can raise the hands, those of you that ever heard about finite state machines before, probably, yeah, probably studying, most likely, because it's an oil technology. And then the second question is, if you know what's that, but answer me when I finish, OK? Because I'm going to be giving you some clues while we are talking. So I'm Renzo Speder. I'm a JavaScript hacker. I came from Barcelona, where it never snows. And I work for my taxi. The, probably you know it. It's very popular here in Germany. Um, yeah, and we have an office there, a technological office there in Barcelona. Uh, apart from the ukulele and the everything, coffees and so on, I love capybaras. And this is not related to the talk, but I always take the opportunity to show you this animal because I know it's amazing. It's the biggest rod in the, in the world, actually. It's pretty nice. So yeah, <laughs> capybaras. So going to a topic, um, this the finest machines, as you all know, probably it's a pretty old concept. It came from the late 60s, uh, but it, it wasn't since like two years ago or so that we were like considering using the finest machines for the UIs, for the clients, the front end. And this quote was really important because it was like the moment that the finest machines start to become trendy nowadays. It's from David Cushit. And it was on the React Rally from 2070. And it's the develop user interfaces is not easy. And here it comes that it's a very simple quote, but it's so true, right? Like those that we are working in the front technologies, in the front end world, we know that it was static rendering, it was PHP with some tweaks. Uh, I don't know, it was just HTML with some CSS injected in. But it, it, that wasn't important before. The server was the, what really matters. But now we are doing complex setups for compiling, like Sean explained this morning, right, with Webpack. We are, I don't know, using very complex libraries. We're doing a lot of stuff. So we move a lot of business logic to the clients, which requires to be performant, and so on. And the problem with that is that we are also introducing many bugs. We are expecting the user to follow all our indications, <laughs> <laughs> which is not always working. Uh, we generate one of the <laughs> it's a really good one. We generate a lot of uh, errors also related to networking or race conditions in general, which probably you all know this window, most likely. And I don't know if any of you, any of you thinks that if you press the cancel button, you actu this actually works. No, this not work. So the cancel button is for you if you're stressed out and you want to smash the button, right? But it, it won't stop, never. So, and this, this is, <laughs> I can't comment anything on that. This adds, basically. So the problem is that because we are introducing a lot of complexity and UIs are not easy, then when we have problems, automatically we approach it with a defensive programming strategy. And what does that mean? That when you have an issue, instead of reconsider what you are doing, you just straight you go straight and fix it. So I give you an example. Uh, we're gonna see a call really quick. That's like probably something that we all have done at some point in our career, right? That's fetching some data from an API and then rendering on the browser. Easy peasy. We fetch the user, set the state, it will render because it's reactive. But then when, I mean we cannot like left the user like that waiting, right? So we have to manage this fetching state. So we have the is loading. So far so good. But what if something is broken? We have to explain, hey, well, when it's broken, show something nice to the user, explain, uh, put a button to retry or whatever. So we have to consider a double catch because we have two promises, of course. Well, we also have to put the errors somewhere. Uh, this is just one way. Um, uh, but maybe we want to cancel because it's an intensive request. So we need to cancel. So I don't know if you're following that or if you're having been in that situation, but if you look closely at this code, you will notice that's a shit. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so can you rise up whoever was in this situation before? Yeah, of course. So why? 
So the why is not because of the architecture, it's not because of the technology. Uh, React won't like save, it, save us from that problem. It won't come a new library called Circular that will fix everything. It's not because of the patterns, it's because of the approach. Because we're doing a bottom-up approach and it has some issues. Those issues are, it's complex to understand when you're doing bottom-up approach. Okay, because you are starting to introduce many exceptions, like we saw. We have a lot of if else uh, cases. We have a lot of, uh, so in our business logics, we introduce a lot of uh, exceptions and that kind of stuff. There is a lot of mutation. So it's very difficult to understand for us. Which also means that it's going to be difficult to test because everything is really coupled. Uh, nothing is isolated. There are no pure functions. So it's difficult to move away. We also end up having those massive setups for do testing. I've seen projects, small projects, with longer testing setups than the actual code, which it's a, it's a problem, of course. If you don't understand something, it's very difficult for you to enhance it because you don't know exactly where you have to do the modifications or you are afraid of breaking something else. This happens, it's risky. So here comes the most important part for me. We introduce a lot of bugs. And when I mean a lot, a lot, I mean a lot of bugs. Okay, we have the side effects, the risk conditions, uh, it's a spaghetti code. Um, so here's the thing. The re refactoring code is not about the time. It's about what you want to refactor. So if you don't understand what you have, you don't know what you have to refactor. So when you understand the what, that will give you the value and the effort, and hence the when. Okay? If not, you end up like this cool Charmander that you are just fixing one bug. <laughs> yeah. You are fixing one bug after each other in code bases that no one wants to work with. And probably, I, I know that in your company you have one of those monoliths, very old school, that no one wants to touch, that is risky. And especially in those old ones, projects, there are usually not too much testing. So that's also a problem. But anyway, focusing on the positive way of the life, the opposite of the bottom-up approach is the top-down approach, right? Makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So the top-down approach basically is that instead of reacting, I'm sorry, to all the issues that you are finding every time, you always reconsider what the hell are you doing and how this bug or feature request or whatever need that's coming to your project can be introduced safely in, in your current code base, right? So going back to the topic of the, of the talk, in the case of the UI, we understand, we understand our product and the interactions inside our product. And how this can be reflected with diagrams or user flows or whatever the name you want to use. This is a random picture of a user flow. It's supposed to be like a block, I think. So here you can see that, for example, well, you probably you can, can read because this is not 4K HD, but it's like, for example, you can click from, so from one block post, you can click on going to recent post, so you see the, the post list, but also from the landing page, you can go there. Or, for example, from one blog post, you can click to contact us. So you go to the contact form. But also from the About Us page, you can go to the contact form. It's pretty obvious. But the thing is that here at the end, at your right, which is like the contact form, there is only two arrows pointing to it, right? So this, have, this has to be reflected in our code. There's only two options to get, the, to, get to here. Why is this important? Because, at least for me, what we do, the engineers, software engineers, developers, we are basically translators. And we, what, what do we translate is human language to technical language. Okay? So if this is the human language, then the fine testing machines is the technical language. You see how well connected it is. So what's a fine testing machine? Is this. Finish. That's it. <laughs> So it, it's really cryptic because it's a mathematical concept and, well, that kind of things from very small people. So the first time that I saw it, I was like that because I didn't understand anything and actually I need help from one of my friends, which is a mathematician. So we can break it down to something that, at least for me, is easier to reason about, which is JavaScript. 
So sigma is the input of the alphabet, and uh, it, it has a finite, not empty set. That basically means it's, this is just one way to express it. It could be an object, right, in JavaScript, that gives you keys, like the action names that we use for Redux, right? And can't be empty, so it, could, it can be an empty object. So far, so good. The S is a finite, finite, sorry, not empty set of states. Could be something like that. It's another object. The keys matches well with the di uh, dictionary, the, with the alphabet that we saw before. What's inside it, each state right now is not important, and uh, actually could be defined by you as a developer depending on your needs. The initial state, right? So the initial state, the only condition is it has to be part of the, our states. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Right? And the delta is the, the tra transductor, transductor, that's the, like the technical name, but it's basically a transition function. So if I have a machine and I know the current state, I have to be able to get the next state. Usually it's more complex like that because it works through an event. But if, for example, your uh, fine testing machine is not based on events, it's always from A to B, from B to A, from A to B, then you don't need actions for example. And what's that? This is a turn still, I think it's the name, this thing that sits in the underground to go in, right? That can be lock or unlock, so you can go in or you can't. The initial state is lock, because if not, the first guy that goes to the underground will go for free in, so we don't want that. We want them to pay the ticket. And the transition is, if you are in lock, move to unlock. If you're in lock, move to lock. Pretty easy. Right? So much more easy than the other thing before that was super weird. So let's see. This was like the how a finest time machine looks. And now let's see like how this applies to a real world example with some anatomy. The anatomy of a fetch call, like the easiest one. So all the finest time machines starts in an idle state where the, your machine is doing nothing, right? Uh, the initial state that we saw before, the S sub zero, is represented usually with that dot and the arrow pointing. So those are the possible states my machine has. Um, those are the events that you can reason about the events like the triggers for the transitions. So if I want to go from idle to fetching, I have to trigger the fetch event, which makes a lot of sense also. And we have the transitions. Very abstract, I know. And I will show you a demo right in a, in a second. But before, I want to explain quick, more or less, like the three core concepts uh, when we're using fine testing machines on the, for the UIs. Sorry. So the first of all is that it's deterministic. As you probably notice, uh, I could start my machine at any state. If I give you a, a se sequence of actions, I can predict in which state you will be. I can create a time travel machine, because I can also subtract events from the machine, so on and so forth, right? So it's also an automata, which basically means that uh, it's a predetermined sequence, uh, which also means that it will act always in the same way, and it doesn't rely on external systems. So that basically means that the machine knows how to move through the different states. It doesn't rely on other systems to know what's going on, or what's the next state, or what was the previous state. Think, uh, when the, for me, this is an uh, example to reason about automata. It's a, a semaphore, a city light, right? The semaphore doesn't need another system. It doesn't depend on the cars that are on the street or the pedestrians, usually, like the normal one. But it moves from red to green, from green to yellow, yellow to red, I think. right? And we want this to be always like that. And we want the semaphore to be independent, because if not, it breaks. If it breaks, people die, and, and that's bad, basically. We don't want to kill people. And the final one, of course, it's finite. Uh, this is important because this is the, the last like, core concept that makes it useful for us to be used on the UIs. If not, it will be the infinite state machine, which is a different one. Uh, and that's for a different talk. <laughs> OK, so a good definition for a finite state machine could be that it's a pure system that can only be in one of a set of finite states. And that's something that I'm quoting myself right now. 
And actually, to be honest, it will be quoting myself six months ago that I gave the talk, but that's fine. Don't worry. So I know this it was too abstract so far. So I'm going to be the first speaker doing some live demo. <laughs> Maybe. So this is my machine. I'm going to be fetching. I know it's broken, and it's broken on purpose. Why? Because it's not implemented. What's missing? This part. It, and it, this is the thing that I'm going to explain to you. But first, let me go through the code super quick on the important part. Disclaimer. Yep, 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 yep. Better? Bigger? OK. I see positive feedback. Um, <laughs> So let me first go through a bit through uh, some parts of the code. So I will try to make it like more like a real world example and less abstract as it was before. Here will be like the machine. We know what's our initial state. Uh, this state's object, by the way, will be the the sigma, so the alphabet, basically the names of the of the states. It's just names of states. Like you will be doing with the uh, action names on Redux, right? So we are defining that when it's on idle, if the event fetch is triggered, then I want to return the fetching state. If it's fetching, I will move to unfulfill to success, on fail to failure. Um, now we will see this, the action, what's that? And then when it's on success, I will move, yeah, to fetching. Yeah, of course. That's true. That's sorry. <laughs> when it's on failure, that's done. And if it's on success, I move again to fetch. Because if you think about it, if I don't do that, when you reach the success, if there is no uh, handler for the action fetch again, you couldn't fetch again, right? You have to say to the machine, either on success, go back to evil state, because then if you're in evil state, you react to the fetch events or introduce uh, the fetch event on the success, right? If I will like remove this from, from here, once you reach success state, you can uh, fetch again, which d that depends on your UI, what you're doing. So in my application, I want to react to that. So the state itself, well, the fetch function is pretty straightforward. And then I have normal render. Okay, that call this function, and then this function, what's doing is rendering different UIs, different components, depending on which state you are, right? And we're gonna go back to this later on because this is very powerful. So, what we, what are we missing? Why is not working? Why, if I comment this line, as it is right now, and we go back, it's not fetching, right? So this is happening because when I click the button, I go from evil to fetching, since I'm triggering the fetch event, OK? But then, when I go to fetch, so when, I, when I'm on fetching, nothing is happening. I'm not doing anything else. I'm just moving the states. I want my finite state machines, in order to be useful, to trigger side effects. So I'm going to be doing side effects. I'm going to be managing my, the side effects of my applications in a safe and controlled way. And more important is the fine testing machine, that, because it's an automata, that knows exactly which side effects has to trigger at any moment. And then I will just, the thing that I plug in to the fine testing machine will react to that. I know it's a bit complex. I'm sorry, but I couldn't like, explain it better. But the idea, basically, is that here, with the props commands, I will show the code later on with all of you so you can hack it around. Uh, I'm saying when the action fetch user is triggered, you have to do this. So here is the cool part, that this one line is the only part that you are binding, in this case, your application, your React application, with the finite state machine. That means that I could take this fine testing machine and move it to Vue, React Native, Angular, whatsoever that I'm using, and it will work the same way. Or if I need this function to be different, because now I'm calling a different API, or because if you are with, I don't know, high network uh, browser, then sure, fetch the user, but if you are in a low network uh, browser, then fetch user light, because it's faster. We can start doing that kind of stuff 
very smoothly and control testable and so on. So if I uncomment this and I go back here, this should be working. Yes. OK. So we get names. And because I told you, since now it's in success, but I am still reacting to the fetching event, if I trigger again, I will get more names and more names and more names. So, so far, so good. But also, what we can do, going back to what we saw at the beginning, right, is that if I want to break this, what we, we have one error. Something like that. I don't get too much. Since, since I have an error component, if something goes wrong and I fetch again, I'm managing also the error state. And this is for fetching an error, but this could work with any UI that you, that you need to implement. Cool. So what we saw, yeah, sorry. So what we saw was the commands. The commands basically is this way to have the find the machine completely decoupled, but it still react independently to which system we're using. And one of the cool features that we have with that is that since you don't have conditions, you, don't have, you can have condition problems, right? Because you didn't show any if else. Yes, there is a switch case, but that's not the thing. It was for rendering. So that's the cool part. It is the couple. You also saw it, right? It is not like you are not married to one framework or, te or technology. And finally, that I didn't show you that, but you can also, since it's deterministic, you can also do automated testing. So how we can do the automated testing? Sorry, let me show you the test. This is the test, OK? It's just one it. It's very easy. And this is te testing 70% of the application. I don't have more tests, just this. So basically, what I'm doing here is get through all the different states of the application and start the application in that state, and then render whatever it's needed. So don't believe me. So see, watch it by yourself. This is the snapshot resolving, which I have the state idle, with, in this case, is this man, the button. This is the fetching, and it will be fetching, searching. This is a success. Na -na 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 -na. You get the point, and this is the error. So basically, you get magically automated, generated a snapshot testing for all your application with just one loop, which is pretty neat, I would say. Actually, this me. This is exactly me the first time that I saw it. So the last thing that I want to show before we finish is this thing. Let me show you. Sorry, that wasn't prepared. But you remember that I told you that it's the couple? So this is how I render things. I'm calling my components library, which is this resolver. And in this case, I only have web environment. So it's returning me this React web. What's inside here? But that basically means that we solve here one of the main issues that we have right now in the React community, that we want to use React for many things. So here I could say, yeah, I also have case native. So return re require React native. Just return the components for the React native environment. I don't need to do any magic like React native web is doing, because all the logic of the application, stage, transitions, and business logics, or the main logics, are completely decoupled from the framework you're using which means, basically, that you can plug and play this fine testing machine to whatever system you need, if that's not fancy. And that will be more or less everything, shortened version. Uh, here is a list of resources. And don't worry, because I'm going to upload now on Twitter the, the demo that you show and the slides, so you can give it a look. Uh, this is the real world examples that is using Visual Studio Code, for example, telemetry. Uh, they're implementing the fantasy machine, and it's pretty complex. And final part, does anyone know what this picture is? Oh, it's amazing. Every time that they give the talk, it's Mars Rover. So Mars Rover, it's, uh, it was a finite scene machine because sadly, like two or three weeks ago, it was de finally dead. But it was so good that it was a fantasy machine designed for like, I, I think it was one year or something like that, but ends up during like four, five, six, seven years. I don't remember the name, but it's pretty neat. How many gazillions of dollars you have to invest to send something to space, and they pick up the fantasy machines to do that. So that's where, how I guarantee that's bug-free uh, system. 
Remember that we are hiring. Contact me if you want. And thank you.